Edutrainment Workshops, the insurance industry's leading education and training platform presents Life Insurance, the entry-level series, the products, the underwriting, and the planning applications to position your practice as the premier provider of insurance products in your community. Get on board, get on track, get to where you're going. And now, your Edutrainer, National Insurance Columnist, Steve Savant. Well, welcome everyone. I'm Steve Savant, your edutrainer and coach for our edutrainment workshops and our introduction into annuities. And all this week, we're going to have to spend the entire week on one product line, the most popular product line, and that is indexed annuities. Well, when we're talking about indices, there are so many indices, and I just want to bring a report out that I saw in the first quarter of 2012 on what indices are being used. And I have to throw in the fixture because it's a player. In the first quarter of 2012, 59.1% of all index annuities were investing in the S&P 500. And then about 23%, which is an actual rise, about 23.4% actually, actually went into fixed. So when we look at these two ideas, you're saying, wow, you know, a lot of money is just going into really two channels. And then everybody else is spread all over. And if you want this, all you have to do is say, Steve, I'd love to see that little report. Just order it and by calling me, or actually writing me, the biz at brokersalliance.com, T-H-E-B-I-Z at brokersalliance.com, and I'll be happy to send it to you and any of the material we talk about today. And heads up, if you missed any of our teaching workshops on the annuities, I really recommend that you go back to day one on that. And if you want to say, where is that? It's in our archives at www brokersalliance.com. As soon as you come to our homepage, just click on the on-demand red button there and it will put you right in, not only to our edutainment workshops, but our, our daily uh, internet talk show, the Business Insurance Zone, as well as my weekend opinion piece, Welcome to the Weekend with Steve Savant. Now all this week when we're talking about indices and indexing and annuities, especially with rates being so low, this is a new place to go, and I mean the crediting cap rates are all over the board, and we're going to get to that uh, so all this week. So when I'm looking at the annuity uh, indices, the whole world of it, and I'm thinking 59% of it is going to the S&P, 23, almost 24% is going to the fixed accounts on almost all these, that doesn't leave too much left to spread between all the other indices. But they're worth mentioning. I have a complete list of the present uses of what index indexes are being used with the American annuity product line and it's quite a large one so I'm going to try to pare that down for our class and talk about some of the ones that are just the basic ones. One of the first ones that I notice that some people drift into once in a while is called the Barclays Capital Aggregate Bond Index. It's formerly called the Lehman Brothers, actually it was Lehman Brothers, Lehman Aggregate Bond Index. And this is a broad-based index. It's maintained by Barclays Capital, and it represents investment-grade bonds that are traded in the U.S. The Dow Jones, one of our big popular secondary markets, is a really pretty good one. It's a stock indicator calculating each trading day, and that tracks the market value of the 30 leading industrial stocks. Again, all these things I'm talking about, you can order the biz at brokersalliance.com. Our Euro stock 50 was a pretty popular one. It's kind of pulled back with all the troubles that our Europe is ha having with their debt and so forth. But the Euro stock 50, it's a market capitalized and weight index of the 50 blue chip companies that are in that participate in the European Union. Now the FTSE, which I really think is kind of a, I always like how they say FTSE, it sounds, a, it sounds rather risque, but the FTSE 100 really is the Financial Times stock index that's tra that trades a 100 share index over in England. Great Britain's London Stock Exchange, and a lot of people like this, they think it has a lot, it's really separate from the Euro, so they kind of think there's maybe a little more protection there, I don't know if that's true or not. Then there's the Gold Commodity Index. For, there was a huge run on gold, as you know. It went all the way up. I don't know where it's closing now. I think it's still over maybe 1450 or 1500 an ounce. But some people who believe in that and really think the gold index, there are annuities that actually tie into the gold index, and that index is coming right out of the London gold fixed market. And I think that's one of those areas where some people say, if I can get to it in a hedge, that could be a position you might want to take. And then probably a big one, especially about five years ago, the Hang Seng, the Chinese, huge Hong Kong exchange. It represents about 70% of the market value of all stocks traded in Hong Kong, and a couple years back, they were a killer index. So that's one that you need to kind of look at, explore, see if that's where you want to go. Then you get into what I call secondary iShares, iShare Barclay Capital U.S. Aggregate Bond Index. 
That's another one of the family of bond indexes that Barclay participates in. And then the other iShares, which are foreign, actually, because remember, we're talking about domestic and foreign indexes. And again, you could go on any of the major networks, like let's say I use CNN.com um, on their money section, and you can go ahead and you can open up the index graph whether it's one day, five day, one month, three months, 12 months, five years, you can get a graph chart on all these and look at that. I don't know, and, I, and I'm, I'm not aware of any of the ones that show any of the, the kind of what I would call the indicators of where these are going, like we use the VIX S&P in, in the United States for the S&P 500. There might be other issues like that that are out there, but you can see them all and look at them and kind of see what the trends are and see if these things are willing to, if you're willing to go a little more foreign than our traditional. But all the indexes, domestic and foreign, are all out there in the public domain. So feel free to go ahead and jump on that. The iShares of the MSCI and the ACWI index, this is a free floating adjusting index. And you look at it, it's about 45 different company, or countries that participate in this and they're emerging markets. They're really coming in, I don't even, I, I would classify them as not the, the big companies that you'd always see at the G7 or the G20, but these are companies that are emerging and some people think because they're at the floor there might be some upward growth potential. You may want to look at that. Then they have the what I call the iShares MCI, but that's the for the Hong Kong index. Again, another foreign index, but something again that you may want to turn your head to when you're looking at this. What I like to do is I like to kind of go out to CNN slash uh, CNN.com money. I go out there and I look at some of these indexes and I kind of get an idea. And no, I don't give any kind of futuristic thinking. I don't know what's going to happen. I have no idea. And I don't know if anybody does. But I just try to get a comfort zone on what I know and so I can at least have a little intelligence when I'm talking to my client. And that's all third-party domain all out on the web on most of the news uh, big cable news carry all this. And then of course, the Lehman Brothers Aggregate Bond Index, which is another fund that's out there, kind of conservative. And then you have the traditional NASDAQ. And a lot of people are still looking at the NASDAQ, seeing how that's going to play out against the S&P 500, and by the way, the S&P 400. The NASDAQ has its traditional index. It also has the NASDAQ 100. And then when you move out of the, the NASDAQ area, again, we go out to the foreign markets where I have the, Ni the Nikkei out of Japan. It's a stock market out of the Tokyo Exchange. And again, uh, I haven't seen much traffic in that. Also, we're looking at, back into the domestic front, PIMCO, U.S. Advantage Index, a comprehensive U.S. bond market index offering exposure to interest rate swaps. And people kind of like that. They may think that's a really good issue. PIMCO is a very popular and well-known name. There's another place. And here's one in the United States that sometimes I think doesn't get the play that it really should, and that's the Russell 2000 Index. The Russell 2000 Index it measures the performance of small caps that are a segment of the U.S. equity universe. The Russell 2000 is a subset of the Russell 3000 Index that represents approximately about 10% of the total market here in the U.S. It includes approximately 200 smaller securities based on a combination of small cap and current index membership. Now, that's something you may want to look into and just take a peek into. That's another option you can do. Now, I talked about the S&P 400, but the actual phrase that I want to use now is the S&P Mid-Cap 400 Index, which is really a benchmark for mid-sized companies. The index covers about 7% of the U.S. equity market, and some people believe that that smaller market, the more mid-size, are more nimble and have more laterability in a market swing, and that's why people sometimes adopt that. Again, go out and look at the historicity of this, see if you feel comfortable with it. And then, of course, the S&P 500 composite. This is the big one we always use, and that's one of the most popular, as I said, in the first quarter of 2012, it represented almost 60% of all the purchases inside the annuities. And keep in mind that when we're looking at the returns out on the uh, public domain of any of these news cable um, uh, sites that use their money sites, you got to remember that this is with dividends and the ones we're talking about are not with dividends. So just it's, it's just a comparison. It's just to kind of get your feet wet and a good understanding, but I can't use that rate of return. Now, just a kind of a little idea, from August of last year to August of this year, it's been a pretty good run in the S&P. So even if you took the dividends out, your index annuity this year, if you were going year to year, point to point, you know, from last August, it has a pretty good return. And then lastly, I want to talk about some of the ones that I would say that are obscure. 
What I have here is I have a, sh a, a good document that not only shows you all the indexed annuity carriers in the United States, but it also maps out across the board what funds or indexes that they use. And it's interesting to note that everybody has different ways of looking at this. For example, as you can probably guess, the, again, the S&P 500 is heavily used as well as the fixed index account. However, then you start to getting into seeing people who are really heavily involved and some of the big ones that are being used by companies right now are the Eurostock 50, the Dow Jones Industrial, the um, Russell 2000, the Hang Seng, and also, surprising to me at least, the NASDAQ 100. Again, with some of the other ones that you could get into, and I mean it's quite a list, you could get into some of the uh, contracts that will give you the kind of flexibility that have multiple um, indexes. And what I like to look at that is to give my client a choice. So when I'm looking at indexed annuities, and I think I want a little bit bigger, broader investment posture, greater than just the S&P 500, I'm gonna be looking at indexed annuities that give me domestic as well as foreign, and in those choices, give me several selections so I can kind of get an idea if I need a client that's sophisticated, feels like they need to be global in their understanding, that's where they kind of want to go on that, and then I'm going to participate. Now, to show you about that, to, to kind of give you a display, as I talked about the first quarter in 2012, after you get past the S&P 500 and the fixed account, which is so popular right now, the NASDAQ 100 brings the first one. It's the number three most sold in the United States right now. Now, I'm not saying that's the best. I'm just saying strictly by sales. The actual NASDAQ 100 is the number one fund after the S&P and the fixed account. Then there's a smattering of others that are so small that it's not really worth calculating. But I noticed the Dow Jones average is a big player and the rainbow index, which is a whole other way of measuring, which some carriers have adopted, could be a whole thing. I have to do a whole show on that. But all these have access to the indexing. Indexing has traditionally been called the poor man's way of investing. A regular S&P account on a variable contract like a VUL or a VA may be costing 10 to 20 cents to participate on the M&E charge. So when people are looking at industry and, and looking at what indexes they're going to choose, you have to, they all can, I all know that since these are, don't have managed fees to it, that usually these funds are going to be much cheaper to play with. And again, because we're traditionally playing in a global market, we're trying to see two areas right now, which is our domestic front, which I've named some of our big, carrier, uh, big players in the indexing, but it also mentions what I would call more traditional foreign markets, the European and the Chinese. And then the third market, which is coming, these emerging countries. These companies are coming into the 21st century, new technology, because they really have nothing to rebuild. They're actually starting from scratch, which can be very, very profitable. So all these possibilities right now are out there for indexed annuities. You can get bucket, many buckets or single buckets, multiple indexes or singular indexes. It depends upon what your mix is. Is. Last part about this, I always like to do a risk tolerance test on the client. Even though we have preservation of principle on, this, on these annuities, and even though we're giving, most of them are giving a flat guarantee, a 0.87 rate of, you know, percentage of guarantees, I always want to bring up the idea of going through a regular tolerance test. Does my client have the risk tolerance for some of these maybe not so known? Like so, S&P 500, is that okay? They're more, they can see that every night on the news, but all these other ones may not be as frequent on media. So they may say, boy, I need to see something I'm comfortable with. But I always like to do a risk tolerance test, whether it's indexed annuities, whether it's index indexing in universal life, or even if I'm buying it, if you're a registered rep, on the outside, I always want to do a tolerance test. And that test, and we're happy to send it to you, all you have to do is write me at thebiz at brokersalliance.com, and I'll send you that tolerance test. And what it does is it measures the client's are they conservative? Are they moderate? Are they aggressive? I'm going to also look at their timeline. When do they need the money? And then be able to kind of manage to their behaviors or their psychological profile on investing and try to match up kind of the indices that we see to make sure that they're comfortable. That's the world of indexing on annuities. It's huge. And you can have all this at the biz at brokersalliance.com.
This has been an edutrainment workshop, the educational division of the National Insurance Clearinghouse, the marketing arm of Brokers Alliance.